darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes were open to see Mark can't help but believe Come on There's nothing that our God can't do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do
so good and you love us so much. You love us so much and what an honor, what an honor to worship you, to come together as our family, as our family, Father, and just lift up your great name. Father, let us never, ever, ever, ever take any of it for granted. Oh, never, Father. such an incredible word for you today, church. And we are so excited and we just pray right now that every heart would be open, every set of ears in this room be open to hear the word that God's about to bring forth, amen, amen. Well, I tell you what, there's not a better place that any of you could have chosen to be than right here because God has such an incredible plan for each and every one of you, man, it's so good. Thank you for worshiping with us today, man. We love you and God loves you so much. And we are family here at Word of Life. So welcome home, church. Thank you so much for joining us today. Whether you're a part of our online family or here with us in this room, we're so thankful that you chose to be here. We wanna let you know, we have a worship night happening on Wednesday, April 24th. We have another water baptism coming up in May and our free vacation Bible school for kids up to age 12 is happening in July. Our monthly newsletter has details about all of this and so much more. So whether this is your first time here, or if you've been a part of our family for years, make sure you have a copy of our newsletter on hand so that you don't miss what's coming up at Word of Life. If you haven't already, now is a great time to silence your cell phones. And we also wanna say thank you again for joining us. God is doing awesome things in and through our church. And we're so thankful that you're choosing to be a part of it all. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How many were here for the first service? <laughs> Hallelujah. God's doing great and awesome things. I tell you, if you weren't challenged, as someone once said, if that didn't light your fire, your wood's wet. Okay. <laughs> Bless God. Bless God. Am I in the way here? No. Okay. They got the pulpit all set. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would. How many were here for or Saturday night? And you guys are a brute for punishment, huh? <laughs> no, it's all good. All good. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we give you complete, complete authority over our lives. Wreck us, Holy Spirit, for your glory and for your honor. Continue to, to do a glorious work that we might, as our dear brother has said, shine, to shine the very life of Jesus Christ through us. Thank you, Father God, for anointing that destroys yokes of bondage. Thank you for love that shines through 
brothers and sisters in Christ for one another. And we give you thanks now for this time, this opportunity that you have given us that we may drink in the goodness of Almighty God. And we give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor in Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. And all of God's people set together in agreement. Amen. Amen. We have our word of life confession. Make your proclamation known into the realms of the heavenlies. Let every demon within the sound of your voice know where you stand in the lordship of Jesus. Here we go. Jesus, be glorified in my life. Holy Spirit, I welcome your presence. My heart is open to receive the ever-living, never-changing word of God. The word that is changing my life, healing my body, setting me free. My faith is growing and I am living in the favor of my God. I declare it, I believe it, and I receive it by faith. Or I am blessed again. One more. I am blessed in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give me one more praise, church. Come on. Hallelujah. Bless God. Bless God. And would you give praise unto our God for our dear brother Dan Mahler. Thanks. Here we go again. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you my hey. Uh, thank you. Hey, guys. Man, fun to be here. What a great house to be in. So, uh, yeah, had fun this morning. It was intense. Probably good you missed it. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> It's amazing. Well, I just opened my Bible. I have no plan. I just opened it because I'm thinking, you know, I'm just listening. I'm taking my time. It's not because we don't know what to say. The Lord always knows what to say. But it's funny. I just crack open my Bible. What's the, that's a, that's a tone of purple. So what, is that the predominant color you see? I color my Bible. I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little childlike. I'm, I mean, like I'm super childlike. I know we've got technology and you can do it on your phones and, but I got my little color code in there and I got what they all mean and I actually use colored pencils that I sharpen. It just, I don't know, it just feels good. Purple in my Bible, the color purple is anything that's Christian conduct, commandments of God or conditions on receiving a promise. Something I'm called to walk in in my Bible is purple. It's fascinating how Somehow, at large, we got the idea over generations that the gospel is all about God blessing us and taking care of us and providing for us. That's a piece of the gospel because that's what, who God is. He's, he's Jehovah Jireh, who knows he's a protector, who knows he provides, who knows he blesses. But that's not supposed to be our goal. Our goal is supposed to grow up into him in all things, to live life in the spirit that the Christ in us is the hope of the glory of God. Our goal is not just to get another blessing from God. Our goal is every day to grow up into him and become more like him as we continue to grow, right? I, I don't know if you understand that. I think in this church, you guys are taught amazing. There's life in this house. I love, I love being here. You guys are fun. Worship is just, worship gets me almost too wound up and I got to come up here and I'm like, this isn't fair. <laughs> This morning, they caught me a little round up. Last night, I was a mess. They surprised me on that song. Today, I knew it was coming. I was a little more ready. <laughs> but it's just amazing how our perspective of Christianity has, I feel like, in the long run, has been skewed to just God taking care of me, blessing me, and doing something for me instead of me becoming more like him. And the reason that I know that's true is not just because of all the scriptures, but when I look just in my Bible and page through page through page through, it's purple everywhere in my Bible. My Bible is predominantly purple, which means I'm called to something. There's conditions and Christian conduct and commandments all through the Bible that I'm supposed to wake up in and understand and pursue and walk in. That's a whole lot more than waiting to die someday and go to heaven and, hey, I'm glad I prayed that prayer. I go through at least three, three full-length purple pens, pencils, colored pencils, just to do my New Testament. Three pencils. I don't go through a whole one pencil for any other color, I don't think. And I go through three for Christian conduct and commandments. What's that tell you? That there's a life to live. 
that Christianity is far from just a confession. It's actually an expression and a manifestation of something we've all become now that he's come. And people are supposed to see our lives and see something in our lives that makes them wonder and inquire. We're supposed to be epistles that are written on the hearts of men. I was talking to some people over here this morning. You know, Peter says to always be ready to give an explanation when they inquire of the hope they see in you. And I'm like, how many of us in our whole Christian life has been approached by somebody that says, hey, why do you live the way you live? Like, what's up about you? You seem like you carry yourself in such a way you intrigue me. Like, how many of us in our workplace, coworker just comes up and says, you just seem like you're full of hope or something. What's up with you? Like, you're different. Like, how many of us, Paul or Peter is making it sound like He's expecting people to notice our lives. And he's saying, you already be able to answer when they ask you and inquire why you're living, why you act the way, why you appear and seem the way you do. When they ask you about that, you be ready to answer. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure how many of us are getting asked that question. (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm not being mean. Because if we're not careful, we're just trying to get through our day. If we're not careful, our whole prayer list is just what we need God to do to make our day work. And we got a lot on our plate, and I need your grace. And God, oh, that's right, the meeting at lunchtime. Ah. And we're just trying to get through it. And somehow God becomes our avenue of blessing instead of the reason we woke up. Are you following me this morning? I want you to see some things in your Bible. go to Ephesians chapter 4 first. See, my whole job this morning in the Lord, if it's a job, because it's not a job, my, my whole assignment, the whole reason I would have this microphone and thank you for letting me be here and stand in this pulpit, I don't take that lightly, is that we're gathered together in order that we might stir one another in love and good works. Like we're here to stay on page, stay on point, and stay focused on why God sent his son. I've learned over the years of traveling, preaching, talking to lots of people, doing lots of counseling, especially in the early years when I'm a full-time pastor, just nonstop people pastoring. And I learned that if you ask a person why God sent his son, they don't have, they don't have a very big answer. It's just, well, so we can be forgiven. And when we die, we can go to heaven. That's usually the answer. The reason God sent his son was so we can be forgiven so that when we die, we can go to heaven. And that's really what's been taught. That's what people come away with the idea of why God sent his son. They're not understanding that he's actually removing sin, making us clean in his sight, giving us all, like it's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, all the inheritance that we get through Christ so that we can walk life in, out in the light, that we have the baton of the new covenant, New Testament church, that we're actually the body of Christ. We're the expression of Christ on the earth. Like, people aren't thinking that way. They're not thinking that they're called to live by the Spirit, that they're to do all things without grumbling and complaining, that it's God working in us, both to will and do for his good pleasure, that we're called to grow up into him in all things, that our conduct is worthy of the gospel of Christ. I'm just quoting scripture. A lot of people are just thinking, God, so when you ask a Christian why God sent his son, We've just been taught it's all about being forgiven. Forgiveness is vital and important, but it's just the very beginning. And it's actually more than forgiveness. He taketh away the sin of the world. Like you're beyond forgiven. Like he remembers your lawless deeds no more. Like you're as clean as if you've never sinned when you stand before God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Most people never actually just embrace that, believe that, and wear that, and wake up with the confidence that God sees them apart from everything they've ever did that now that their hearts have changed, bothers them. Who knows that there's things in your life that you do that you grow up into a different place and you go, oh man, I wish I didn't. Oh man, that was wrong. Oh man, right? So once you come to that place And you say, man, if I could go back and do that over, I'd do that different. Now you're no longer the person you're remembering. You're changed. 
So that person will never stand before God. This is what stands before God. So God doesn't even remember where you've been or what you've done. According to scripture, he remembers it no more. So we probably shouldn't spend a minute regretting. We should probably spend the next minute being sincere in repentance and turning from and turning to and going after high truth. And never what? Looking back. Because you're clean. As soon as repentance hits your heart and you know you could change that if you could, you would. That's your answer. I've seen so many things in my life through redemption, through the blood of Jesus, restoring lives. I've seen people, you know how we say you make your bed, you sleep in it? I've seen Jesus put people in a new bed. And I think it's the bed he made and the sheets are clean and white and righteous and they're not dirty and stinky and stained. Pill ain't summer sweaty and it's an amazing bed. People say, well... You made your bed. You got to sleep in it. I'm thinking, he made me a bed. I'm going to crawl in that one. In the gospel, we don't always get what we deserve, right? Like, I've seen, I've seen God. Well, I was just in a service two months ago. They put the testimonies on, on the internet. I think the church on the YouTube, the little girl sharing the testimony. She was 14. I think she was 14. She started cutting. Cut her, tore her thighs all up, cutting legs. Dark season in her life. Now she's 16. She doesn't know why she did it, wish she never did it, and regrets that she did it. So now she says, well, I'm just ashamed, and I'll never wear shorts again in my life. She's 16. I'll never wear shorts again because I don't want people to see my legs, and I don't want to have to explain it because I wish I could forget it, but I can't because every time I look at my legs, I remember it, and I'm just brought it on myself, and this is what I get, and what a dummy. You know, what? it's just regret. She's in the service, and we prayed for everybody, and she's over there, looks like she's having a medical 911 experience. <laughs> she's freaking out, trembling, shaking. She's just, she doesn't even know. You looked at her, and it looked like she's having some kind of seizure. She's undone. She had all these little girls surrounding her. She starts checking her body. The scars she manually put on her body are gone. Completely gone. Why? His mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy looks at a 14-year-old girl in a dark season faced with all kinds of challenges, things, stuff, adolescence, young life, stuff, right? Uh, And forgive me, 14-year-olds, listen, love you. There's a lot to learn, a lot to grow in, a lot more wisdom to acquire, okay? So God knows all that. Now, when you're 14, you don't know that. (laughs) <laughs> but just understand that there's some folks that know some things that you're yet to learn. And, 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 and she's coming to this place where she's going, oh my goodness, what did I do? As soon as she does that, grace and mercy separates her from what she did. As soon as her heart is sincere and she goes, oh my goodness. Now, if she doesn't have the gospel, all she has is regret. Man, stupid what I did. I can't believe I did that to my body. Can't believe it. And that's all she has the rest of her life is regret and memory. But with the gospel, she has transformation, change, etc. And God says, I'll take it a step further. I see this little girl. If she, if she would get to go back and do that over now that she sees what she sees, she would never do that again. She doesn't even know how she did that and why she did that. Man, I'm looking at a girl that never did that. So we might as well make it as if she never did that. And he just took it away. When she shared her testimony, she calmed down enough to communicate. It took her a little while. It would have took you a while. I was in a service in Washington. 14 girls lost their scars. And when they checked their bodies, they fell on the floor screaming. And their friends had to testify for them because they were on the floor done. Because some of their bellies were sliced like this. And when they looked under their shirts, there was clean skin. And they screamed and crashed. And it just started to, ah, boom, ah, boom, ah, boom, ah, boom. 14 people lost their scars. Imagine that. That they manually carved into their body. Because Jesus said, I'll see you as if you've never done it. Isn't that beautiful? She shared her story. And a little girl sitting over here started to tremble and cry. She must have had a hundred marks on her forearms. She started to tremble and cry and felt the presence of God. She pulled up her sleeves and they're all gone. God did another thing and another thing. Why am I telling you this? 
He's so merciful and he's so amazing and he wants to empower us not to just lose the things we did, but to become so surrendered, so holy given, so walking in the light because he paid for something called restoration, redemption, and he wants us to live in this new life. You get it? It's more than the scars going away. It's seeing that he doesn't see her for where she's been and what she's done. He doesn't see a 14-year-old that was in deception. He sees a 16-year-old that wants change. Yes. That's what he sees. And he's way bigger than what she did when he was four, she was 14. And here's what I've learned. If God won't judge you for where you've been because mercy triumphs over judgment, who knows that scripture? If he remembers your lawless deeds no more, is he remembering where she's been and what she's done? Will that ever be mentioned when she stands before him in that day and say she lived to be 82? That thing has been going the whole time, right? In the presence of God. So let me ask you this. If God won't judge her for where she's been, then why are we all okay with where she's been judging her? Maybe he does make all things new. Maybe old things really do pass away and all things become new. Maybe we really are a new creature in Christ. Now, without this component of repentance... I don't think we open the door to this kind of grace without releasing faith and believing God can love me like this. I'm not sure that we've received the grace that reveals that kind of love. It's one thing for me to say God loves you. I'm always right. It's another thing for you to be loved by God. That's a whole different story. It's one thing for me to say he's merciful. It's another thing for you and me to obtain his mercy. You see? Just throwing that out at you. I'm just, I'm just because I think we're heading somewhere. I'm kind of finding out where we're going as we're going. But oh my goodness, where did I turn you? Ephesians four. Imagine that. Purple. <laughs> Ain't that something? <laughs> my whole Bible's purple. <laughs> I just want to exhort you this morning. I want to stir you in love and good works. Okay. Verse eleven. He himself, uh-oh, huh. I need you to do something quick. Back up to Ephesians 3, it's not far away. Okay, I'm just going to read. I'm just going to read. Verse 8, Ephesians 3. I won't preach. I'm just going to read. It'll go quick. I, I did it in the last service somehow. It's hard for me to do, to read and not preach, but I'm going to try to do it twice in a row. It's going to be an amazing accomplishment in the Lord if I do this. To me, who am in less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you know how hard it is not to preach right there? And to make all see what is the communion or fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God would be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ would dwell in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled 
with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that's working in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I, Paul, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling to which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body, there's one Spirit, just as we were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. <laughs> oh, this is so good. So what did we just read here? Whew, you could just find that page in a field somewhere, and you probably have enough. <laughs> like, what? So who sees that this is way more then God sent his son to forgive me so that I can go to heaven. This is a life I become. This is something I live. This is something I give myself to because I'm no longer in darkness. I'm out of darkness, in the light, in the world, not of the world. I'm not conformed. I'm transformed because I'm thinking like I've never thought before. Do you get it? I'm actually following Jesus. I'm living by the Spirit. I'm not living by my flesh anymore. Sensuality and feelings and emotions. No, I'm not letting them be my strong reality anymore. In fact, my feelings and emotions get realigned as my motive in life changes. When I'm self-centered, I'm scared. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I'm discouraged. When I'm self-centered, I'm offended. I need to be right. I care about how you feel about me. When I'm not self-centered, all those things change. None of us had to learn how to be angry. You did not stay up late to master that. None of us had to work at being discouraged. Nobody hit the books hard and stayed up late to conquer or to master self-consciousness. It just came by instinct and it was part of the package. And it's self-centeredness. And man thinking for himself has an emotional makeup behind it. Where people make a mistake, they say, God gave us emotions. No, no, no. Not the ones you grew up with, he didn't. Adam gave you those. Make no mistake. The emotional makeup you grew up with is totally perverted. Because it all flows out of a self-centered wellspring. And it's you thinking for you. That's why the first noise you learned to make was, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> and as sweet and precious as you are, you're going to need Jesus someday. <laughs> Mine, give me, you two little toddlers, they're playing with toys. There's a little plastic truck there. They haven't even noticed it because they're into these other cool toys. And that little truck, as soon as the one toddler touches the toy, the other one wants it. You ever see it? As soon as they touch the toy, the other one, wow, wow, you didn't even care about the toy. You didn't even know it was there. So they touched it. Now, I'm just telling you, the Lord didn't make that. That came through Adam. And that's every man for himself. And the prerequisite for the gospel isn't pray this prayer called the sinner's prayer. It's deny yourself. Because you living for you is the biggest lie you'll ever live. Because you were never made for you. You were made for his image. That's why abortion shouldn't be an argument. It's, not, it's a no-brainer. Suicide is such a deception. Because people get tricked into saying it's their life. Which well, my body. It was never your body. It was always designed to be his body in, or him in your body. It was never your life from the beginning. It was always designed to be him and you. Suicide is taking away him and you. Canceling purpose, potential, destiny, and legacy. Suicide is a dramatic deception. 
Because somebody gets tricked into taking what's not even theirs. That's how much of a lie self-centeredness is. Abortion is a big argument because it's my body. It's women's rights. It's me doing with my body what I think is best. But the whole time, it's not your body. It's his. You're not your own in the Lord. So these things are dead, dead arguments to the Christian faith. Now, the world will argue tooth and nail, but we should understand that life is not our own. We've been bought with a price. We died to ourselves. We denied ourselves. Let me ask you this. How can we, it always fascinated me how I did counseling for years and how we deny ourselves when we're full of so many rights and we can be violated and so many lines can be crossed and chips can be knocked off our shoulders. I thought when you deny yourself, all that stuff would go away and you'd have one right just to be more like him. Just a thought. <laughs> I have a lot of purple in my Bible. I've happened to read it and I actually believe it and I counsel it and I minister it. And I teach people this is the way we can live. And I've learned this, that unless you live that way, you'll never understand the freedom we sing about. If you have any self-centeredness in your life, it's a form of bondage. It's actually a prison. The Lord has showed me. I was just in a teen ranch with troubled teenage boys, 14 to 17. It was 35 of them. And I got to preach to them for four sessions. After the second session, one came trembling and said, I want to live what you're talking about. It makes total sense to me. I've been so selfish. I caused so much trouble. I want to live my life in God. And I said, okay. He said, can I do that? I said, oh yeah, you can do that. He said, can I get water baptized? Like, so I didn't have an order call. They're, the order call's coming to me. They're like, preacher, you didn't give me a chance to get saved. But when I look at the Bible, that's what happened. They lived their life a certain way and people came up to them and said, what must we do to be saved? We're trying to get them to shake their head yes and agree with us. And they're coming to the Christians in the book of Acts going, the way you live is ridiculous. I'm mind boggled. I can't deny it. How do I live like you're living? That was their evangelistic tool. In the book of Acts, it was the lives they lived. Not they're going on the street corners preaching. The lives they lived were so evangelistic that men trembled in their boots and wanted to know how they can be like them. Paul and Silas are beaten for the gospel. They're not mad at God. God, you can't even cover our backs. I thought you were our rear guard. You asked me to go to village to village, town to town and preach. And every time I go, I get pummeled and hammered. You think just one time you could protect me? Hello? Nope. He's probably chained to a wall with his cut up back against the stones. Probably. And he's singing songs to God. And Silas they ain't complaining. I mean, they are lashed brutally. And they're singing songs and thanksgiving and hymns to God. And the whole place is a bondage. The whole place is a lockdown. And the place gets shook. And their doors just didn't open. Everybody's doors open. Chains are falling off. And everybody's free. The guard, the guard is going to fall on his sword because he's a dead man. It happened on his guard. Prisoners escaped on his watch. He's a dead man. Doesn't matter what the reason. You're dead. You did a poor job. So he knows they're going to execute him. Might as well do it myself. He's ready to fall down on his sword. And Paul says, hey, hey, hey. We're all here. We didn't run. We didn't leave. We're here. Don't you harm yourself. And he's like, you got to be cute. Who are you? That's really what he's thinking. He's like, what is up with you? You're preaching this Jesus, they beat you for it, chain you to this wall, and you're singing to him, praising him, telling him he's amazing. <laughs> he says, what must I do to be saved? That's evangelism. <laughs> We've turned it into make sure you go to heaven when you die. <sighs> Instead of Straight up heaven while you live. Fellowship and communion with God. Are you with me? I want you to see this. He says the whole call of God is that the manifold wisdom of God would be made known by the church to the powers and principalities in heavenly places by the church. He already accomplished this in his eternal purpose in Christ our Lord. And we have boldness, access with confidence through faith in him. 
Man, I wish we would all just live that way, right? And then he says, for this reason, because of this calling, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom a whole family in heaven and earth is named. And he prays out this prayer of being established and founded and rooted and grounded in the revelation of love. He actually says that love passes knowledge, and the revelation of that love will fill us with all the fullness of God. I'll be honest, I don't have a clue what that means. That sounds amazing. What's the fullness of God mean? Like, doesn't even sound possible. But I'm sure it means no lack, no wanting, no insecurity, no vacuum, no emptiness. To know the love of Christ is to be filled with all, not most, not some, because a little dab will definitely do you of the fullness of God. But you're filled with all the fullness of God. Why is it that way? So that your life becomes a living epistle. People see the way you walk, your attitude, your consistency, your no fail, no nonsense way you come across. They see what you've just went through and they never see you change, all that kind of stuff. It speaks to the world. It's evangelistic. To be filled with all the fullness of God. Why? Is that just so you're walking around full? Man, I'm full, dude. Yeah, I'm full too. Yeah, dude, you look great, fool. Yeah, you look great, too. What what are you fool for? So you can just pour it out. He anointed your head, and your cup runneth over. Why does your cup run over? So it pours onto dry ground. So there's some for everybody. It's not for you to be full. It's for you to be running over. Isaiah said it this way. He fills the thirsty and floods the dry ground. This is not about you feeling blessed. It's about your life being so changed that it has to bless people. Your attitude, your mentality, your focus, your perspective. That you actually intrigue people and people learn to enjoy to be around you and get inquisitive. And even if they mock you in the beginning because they don't understand, they learn to respect and see the consistency and the solidity in your life. And now they're asking questions. I'm telling you and inviting you into that life because it's possible for everyone because it's scriptural. It might sound like too much and you might sound like you've never even considered it and you're a million miles away from it, but you can start that process today by what I'm going to read and you can go after him in that manner and be convicted. You say, well, I've already blew it at my workplace. No, no, no. You blew it at your workplace if you never pursue change. If you never get up and live from that place you think you blew it. Because I promise you this, six months from now, living consistent, your coworkers will forget the last 16 years. And in the first month, they will hold those 16 years in front of you like it's today. But after a while, they'll see. And it won't take long of consistent and just living in life that all of a sudden they'll forget those 16 years and now you got every eye fixed on what you've become. I enjoyed that in two different workplaces that I worked after I got saved. I worked two secular jobs before I got, (laughs) they asked me to pastor, my church asked me to pastor three times, and I was like, I'm not a pastor, I'm a warehouse worker in love with Jesus, now leave me alone. (laughs) They saw God moving in my life, miracles, he likes to know, you're a pastor, I said, I'm a believer. The reason God's doing these things isn't because I'm a pastor, it's because I'm a believer, I just found it in my Bible. And they said, no, no, you don't understand. You're a pastor. And I'm like, I don't know anything about a pastor. I just know I'm a believer and I'm having the time of my life. And they said, do you understand we're not asking you to sacrifice? I worked Teamsters Union 15 years. I had four weeks vacation accumulated. I had seniority. I could pick my jobs. And then that time in 80, or uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, I, got there, I got hired in 82 or 3. That time in 82 or 3, I was, I was actually making the top of income for just a blue collar, no degree in college job. By the time I'm in the mid 90s, we're talking 95, six, seven, my pay was actually substantial compared to what a lot of people were making in a factory because I was Teamsters Union. My church came to me and said, do you understand we're not asking you to sacrifice, we will match everything you've acquired, everything you've built, every, your vacation, your income, you will step into everything you have now, you'll just be here pastoring, and you'll have the same everything you had. That's what they told me. I've never even been to a day of Bible school. And they're saying, we'll match your salary, 
your vacation and your benefits. Well, they couldn't match Teamsters benefits because they were the best in the country, but they did their best and they even paid into my IRA, they said they would do because I had benefits with Teamsters. And I still said, zero interested. <laughs> See, it's not a job. It's not, a, I'm living my life in Christ. I didn't, I had no, like, I'm not pushing into ministry. I'm not thinking when I get into ministry, I've arrived. I'm in Christ every day. I'm having the, if I had this platform or not, I'm the same. I, I got bags of seed over me. I'm sowing into people's lives. I'm Danny Gospel Seed, and I'm having the time of my life. Whether I had this platform or not, I'm walking in love. I'm showing mercy. I'm making peace, and I'm living Jesus, and I'm going to pray for folks. I don't need this platform. This platform isn't my identity. This is just what I get to do as an overflow of what I've lived for a while. They asked me to pastor... Because I was working a secular job. I started pastoring for two years and I fell apart, man. I cried a lot. I'm not saying anything negative about church behind the scenes. It just felt this way to me. It wasn't that it was this way. It felt like a business. Board meetings. I cried through board meetings. I felt like it was more about the church functioning than it was Jesus. And I'm not saying those things were real. It just was my take. It just, I was just like, I just wanted all that business side to go away and just let it all be about Jesus. I cried. I ruined a few board meetings. They shouldn't have even had me on the board. No, no. I cried in board meetings. Like to where they, I couldn't recover and they called the meeting. I was a mess. So I told them I can't do this ministry thing. I don't understand ministry. I said things feel violated. I feel like sometimes this is a business. I feel like sometimes it's, it's not the right reasons. I, just, I said I, it's easier for me to go to work. I'm just going to go find a dark sinful place and go shine. That's like easy. So I asked God to put me in the darkest place he could find. And he did. I mean, it was a godless atmosphere. There was sexual sin stuff going on. There was so much stuff in there. Nobody even, God was, there was no awareness of the Lord. And I got hired. <laughs> I could stand here for two hours straight and not take a breath and tell you testimonies from that six month period of work. Words of knowledge, things, full-grown men crying on their forklifts, head supervisor rocked in the aisle, go to his apartment after work, pray for him, and God slays him on his couch, and he wakes up transformed. I, I got so many stories. The guy interviewing me, pushing the folder away because he challenged me and said, stop using this interview as a tool to evangelize me. I said, excuse me? He said, come on, you don't have to bring Jesus into every one of your answers. You're doing that as a tool to evangelize me. I said, are you for real? You actually think that was in my heart? Jesus is my life friend. He's not my theory. He's not my theology. I don't feel compelled to evangelize you. I said, he's good news. He's in my heart. He's my life. I can't not tell. Oh, you can't tell me you can't answer this question without bringing in your faith. I'm not bringing in my faith. He's my relationship. He's my love and he's my life. And he said, well, I need you to answer this last question without bringing in your faith. And he seems frustrated. And I pushed the folder to the side. And I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do, sir. This interview is over. Because you know what I see? Two and a half years ago, you turned from the Lord. And you got your heart hurt. And it got hard. And it's costing you your family. Your marriage is on thin ice. And you have lost your relationship with your children. And I'm telling you right now. And I gave him time frames. And I spoke to him. And I was coming off the leash, baby. I know. You have no idea. I was up on the table. And I'm ready to crawl across the table. And grab him to where he can't escape. And I'm going to say, fire in Jesus' name. And believe it comes. And he's going to go, ah. And I'm coming. And I'm on the leash. I'm still on the chain, but I'm coming. And I'm coming. And I'm on the table. I'm not joking. I'm not exaggerating this. I'm on the table. And I said, you look me in the eyes and tell me that one thing I said isn't true and totally accurate. Look, you can't. I said, I'm coming to pray for you. You can't. I said, I'm praying for you. This is my interview. God will show you stuff. Because it ain't about you. You're not offended at his, you're not, he doesn't even have the ability to offend you. And all of a sudden I found myself for some reason coming off the table and I didn't pray for, I didn't attack him. And I somehow strangely got calmer 
And I said, sir, you look me in the eyes. You haven't answered my question. And you tell me that one thing I said wasn't totally accurate and true, time frames and everything. He said, it was very true. Then what do you think just happened? I said, God is calling you home. God is calling you home, sir. Come home to God. And I said it aggressive. And I turned and just walked out and got in my car and went, that was my interview. <laughs> I wanted that job. I thought, oh, well, there's other jobs. <laughs> I get home, phone message. That's normal. Hey, this is Bill, uh, H&R. We just had an interview. I know it ended abruptly and kind of different. <laughs> But I've decided to hire you, and bring you on board. <laughs> Gave me all my instructions for orientation, where to be, when to be there, blah, blah, blah. Any questions? No questions. He did a great job. Good H&R guy. I did all my stuff. I'm hired. I'm there two months, two months, two months. Haven't seen Bill. I don't even know where Bill is. I'm just on the floor. It's a high pace work, computers, standard paid for what you put out teams of eight they were smart everybody pushing each other because y'all made each other money I did the job my whole life I could do it without sweating I could have outworked any of them kids that just got hired I was 38 they called me grandpa it was so funny and they're wearing gym suits and sweatsuits to work because they're running like deer, but they're panting and sweating and their stuff's falling over and I'm just cruising along and they're going because I did it my whole life and I did it efficient and effective and I didn't want to be the top man, so I hung about third out of our eight. Most of those kids wouldn't have known what to do with the extra money anyway. I'm working there two months and I hear an intercom call my name to office three, whatever, 300 and whatever room number. I said to my boss, did they call me off the floor? He said, I don't know why they're calling you off the floor. They should know you're on the clock. You're on your team. I said, listen, man, I'll make it quick. It has to be important. I said, uh, where is that? He said, that's the new wing. All the cubicles back. You go down. And he said, you'll see the numbers. And I said, okay, what was it? And he told me the number. And I said, I'll be right back out. You know me. He said, I know. So I took off running. I go and I get to the door number. And the door isn't latched. It's, it's pushed shut, but it isn't latched. So I just held the knob and knocked because it would have opened and nothing, nothing. So I, there's my H&R guy that I crawled over the table after <laughs> standing on his, at the corner of his desk with his hand on his desk, trembling like he's having a medical experience. He looks like he needs 911. He just needs the love and mercy of God. He's trembling and he's got sweat. He has this beautiful, shiny head. Like, I'm talking, like, no, like the best head. Like, like you just want to rub it. Like, I when in the interview, I was tempted. I, <laughs> his head was amazing. Just, just this beautiful, shiny head. Sweat pouring off of it. He's trembling, and I said, Bill, are you okay? He looks right in my eyes and says, I need to come home. Can you help me come home? And I lose it. Now watch this. I could have did the interview. I could have just answered the questions. I could have maybe not mentioned Jesus. I probably couldn't have, but I guess I could have just did the business of the interview and got hired and, and I'm just another guy that Bill hired. But that's not why Jesus lives in me. It's not why I'm on the planet. Every person I pass is an opportunity to sow a seed and have some level of impact to where at least I watered or maybe I sowed or maybe I watered or maybe I reaped where I didn't even sow. But one of those things should be happening at some level. You see? He confronted me on my language. I confronted him on my motive. He confronted me that my motive couldn't be that. And then he got rocked with a word of knowledge. 
So now he's two months in, can't get away from what happened and can't get away from the conviction. And the whole time the Holy Spirit's just pow, 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 pow. for two months. He lasted two months. That had to be torment. <laughs> but now he's standing shaking and he says, Can help me come home. And I burst out bawling in tears. And I said, oh my goodness, Bill. I'm crying because he's coming home. Yay. Like that means something. So I finally got to touch that head. Oh, it was trauma, man. I got his head. I centered it too, baby. I remember it. I said with a loud voice, Father, I'm crying. Father, if he's touched anything unclean, if he's defiled his soul, his life, his conscience, his body, God, and I start declaring, he said, I said, wash him in the blood of Jesus, Lord. And this man goes on the floor of his office. Knocked out. And I'm like, I'm done. I laughed. Just closed the door behind me, ran back out on the floor and started working. I'm out there for 40 minutes or so working and these arms came around from behind me and wrapped me real tight and I felt a head laying on my shoulder and I looked and there's Bill's face and shiny head. I said, <laughs> his head was amazing. <laughs> I turned and looked and started to cry again because when I looked in his face, you could see he was home. Ain't that something? Work. I'm just work. I'm supposed to just be working, just earning an income, paycheck, tool, work, tool, earn a living. In no. Everywhere you are is your mission field. You never not live Christ. You don't put him on and put him off. You wear him. My main persecutor in that job, my main persecutor in that job was the head guy of the whole deal. Now you think he'd be trained to be more professional. And you think I could be tempted to think that and look down on him because he's not more professional. And in his position, he should know better and set a better example. And I could let that kind of get in my crawl, I guess. But I guess not. He's my main persecutor. He'd walk through in the morning. We're all getting ready to start the day. And he'd say, well, hallelujah, brothers. And he'd have this walk about him. And, and he's just this thin guy that was non-assuming and he was the kind of guy the way he came across he would get these looks that a, a tough guy would want to squish him but I hurt for him because I realized how insecure he was and he was using his position for power and it was and I don't hate him for it I cry for him for it so one day he walked by the aisle and he said, how you doing, Dan? And he had his walk to him. He sees me. He says, how you doing, Dan? I said, hey, I'm doing great. How are you, buddy? He said, I'm doing good. I took, he took two steps away from me. I took two steps away from him. And Holy Spirit told me he scammed me. He's not doing good. And I usually don't get a download this thorough. I usually get it as I speak. But he said, deepest depression of his life, quitting his job, moving back to New York, suicidal, and hasn't slept for six months or something. And I spun and said, hey. You scammed me. He says, scammed you? Yeah, you didn't tell me the truth when you said you're good. What do you mean? Depressed, suicidal, quitting your job, moving back to New York. You haven't slept a night sound for six months. And he's undone. And there's no way you can run from that stuff. But watch this. If he offends me, I don't hear that. If he bothers me, I don't hear that. If I sincerely care for him, God can he let me hear that because he knows I'm going to steward it with compassion. If my heart isn't in agreement with him, he can't tell me that kind of stuff because I won't handle it the way he would. But if I'll handle it the way he would and my heart's one with him, I'm in. He can tell me anything. I've been in situations where God had me in front of young ladies, gave me the name of the family member that molested them, how it happened and how it affected them and how God wants to intervene and heal and watch them get restored through a word of knowledge in an intimate thing that you don't even want to touch with a 10 foot pole. Why? Because he can tell you anything when he's speaking it to compassion. 
when he's speaking it to love. He came to me trembling and said, does it show? I said, oh, no, it doesn't show. I said, there's a term in Christianity called hypocrisy. It means a game player wearing a mask. You're doing a great job. He said, well, then how can you? And when he went to say, how can you know? It hit him how I knew. The one he persecutes and mocks. In mid-stride, he said, well, then how can you? And trembling came upon him. I said, that's exactly how I knew. The one you persecute and mock, and he loves you, and he's real. And he wants to set you free. He said, I think we need to talk. I said, I think we probably need to talk. We couldn't right there in the hall in the job. I'm on a computer. I got eight men on a team. He walked away trembling. A half hour later, he's shaking in the aisle. He comes across the aisle. He says, I'm overwhelmed by what happened. I have to leave. I'm going home for the day. Can you come to my apartment? Guys, that never happens if he bothers me. That never happens if my life's my own. If I'm self-righteous, judgmental, thinking what an arrogance. It's amazing how these people, these wimpy guys get these kind of positions and use them to push power. That's what people do and they despise people like that instead of recognize they're lost and confused. I'm just giving you some practical examples. This stuff happened a long, long time ago, but it was on the work job, on the place where I worked. The reason I went there is because I didn't understand ministry, and I do way better in darkness. When I was in ministry, everybody talked Christian. Everybody said amen. Even the backslidden people that I just counseled were praise the Lord, brother. <laughs> at least at work, they were legit. <laughs> It's just easy for a Christian to go into darkness when they understand who they are and shine as a light. Light looks really bright in deep darkness. Long story short, I went to his apartment. He got rocked. I prayed for him. He was out on his couch, and I snuck out of his apartment while he was out on his couch. I thought, this man's going to sleep tonight. I went to church Sunday, came home. He's on my message machine. I'll never forget it as long as I live. He said, Dan, good morning. It's so-and-so. He said, I just want to thank you for Jesus. And then he said this. It sounded hilarious because he, he was overwhelmed. He said, peace, 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 three times. My wife and I are going, what's he doing? He says, peace, three times dramatically. And he says, I never knew there was such a peace. Dan, I slept all night. You left. I don't even know when you left. I just woke up. The peace of God is in my heart. Man, I can't wait to see you. Thank you for Jesus. And he was weeping and he hung up. On her, and then I, we, my wife and I, <laughs> it's just another day in the life of Jesus. Amen. Why am I saying this on a Sunday morning? Because everywhere you are, you have those opportunities. And they don't have to be crawling over a table, words of knowledge intense. They can just be you being who you are in Christ in a way that's sowing a vital seed in somebody's life that they can't escape. You could be pouring water on something God already used through somebody else to sow. Or you might even find yourself catching a fish that you didn't even prepare to be cleaned. No matter how it happens, we all rejoice together because we're an army living for the same reason. Are you with me? Yeah. So that's what he's saying here. And then, and then he, he says this in, in four. One body, one spirit, one hope. Wow. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. I'm not being negative or mean when I say this. Listen, today's church, you guys are coming from all over the place. You're coming from a, from a broad geographical span. It's not like the church of Colossae, the church of Philippi. Like you guys are representing a huge geographical area. And you're coming here to gather because you like it here. For some reason, you're coming here. And I'm glad you like it here. But I don't even believe that's why they're not doing this to entertain you. They're not doing this for you to like it here. It's a sincere worship time. You can tell that. 
And, and we're all to be one heart, one mind, one faith, one spirit, all here for the same reason so we can grow up into the same truth, so we can all have the same call, so that we can go out of these doors and live the same way. Watch. And if you touching people in your sphere of influence, I'm not talking dramatic. I'm not saying if you go into Walmart and everybody's laying on the floor screaming fire, if that don't happen, you didn't hit it right. No, no. Just loving somebody. Just showing kindness. Praying for a hurting person. Helping somebody into their car that's having a hard time with their stuff and getting over the curb. And then finding out what's going on and blessing them and believing for them. And then going over to your car and you're like, yes, it's so amazing because you're on the earth for that. And whenever you step out and begin to live that way and live outside yourself, there's such a feeling of just freedom and wow and yay. And I remember the first lady I ever prayed for weeks after I was saved in a post office, the whole place got silent because I said out loud, I will pray for you, ma'am. And they're all like, oh my gosh, probably half of them or more went to church, but I'm one of those Christians. I'll never forget it. I sat on the bench. She turned. Nobody left me in line. I'm back. 11 people back probably. She paid for stuff and she said, sir, thank you for your offer. I'll wait on the bench. I said, oh, and, and I needed to get my thing. I don't even remember if I went through the line or if I just shot over, but nobody said, hey, go pay. But I ended up sitting on the bench with her and I'll never forget it. I prayed for that lady. She couldn't sleep at night. These pains would throb and ache her. It was arthritis, progressive. And when she got still and quiet at night, it amplified. It would just ache, she said, in her body and radiate. And I just prayed for her. And I remember her doing these little sighs. They were so sweet. These little 82-year-old sighs. Oh, oh, oh. She was just, oh. And, and I was praying. And I'm thinking, God, you're touching this lady. And it almost was like she wasn't there. She's just like, oh. And I said, and I started ministering, you know, the night and the sleeping. And so I'm telling you, it's all going away. Bye -bye. And she's like, oh. And I said, Father, thank you for your presence. I think I lightly kissed her on the forehead or squeezed her. And I got up and left. And she's just sitting there with her eyes closed. And I just left. I get out in the parking lot. And I'm like a wild man. I'm like, yeah. Duh. I was like, duh. And I had this pastor saying, you never find your identity through ministry. Find your identity in Christ. And all your ministry should flow through who Christ is in your life. That makes sense. I get that. I teach that. I've lived that. I got to my truck and I said, Lord, I'm really ramped up right now. Like that got me wired. I said, am I crossing some line? Am I finding all my zeal through ministry? He said, no, Dan. You feel the way you do right now because you're living the exact reason you're on the planet. And I went... I'm screaming. I thought, I better get in my truck. People think I'm loony. So I got my truck, shut the door, and then I screamed. Oh, I screamed loud. There's so much freedom in selflessness, so much freedom in loving others, so much freedom in walking in the light as he's in the light. I'll close with this. I'm not sure what we accomplished this morning. I didn't go anywhere near where I thought I was going, and I went to a lot of places I never even thought I was going. But this is what I actually wanted to read, and I see I'm right up on it. Verse 11, look at this. He himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping. Why? For the equipping, not so we can build a conference around them, so they minister to us. Come on. That's what we do. And then we all go for ministry, go to get a word. The reason they're anointed, the reason these giftings are in the body is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up and edifying of the body of Christ. Now watch, verse 13. You can't get around this. This is in our Bible. Till we who? Till we all. Oh, he's talking to the room. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. That means the perspective we're all supposed to have now that he came and who we are in him now that he did what he did. That's how we resist the devil, steadfast in the faith. We're obedient to the faith. We're built up in the faith. 
We're striving for the unity of the faith. He puts the word in front of faith, the in front of faith, because he's separating it from a tool called faith to move a mountain, and he's turning it into a perspective that we're all supposed to have across the board of why we're here, why he's in us, and who we are now that he came. That should be a unity in this room, no matter where you come from geographically, we should all be coming for this reason right here. It's scriptural. I could take you to Philippians 3, and Paul emphatically is saying the same thing. He's saying, look, I'm going to lay a hold of him. I want to get to know him. Oh, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection, right? And then he says, not that I've apprehended, not that I'm already there, but I'm pressing on. And I do one thing, not one of two, one. I forget what lies behind, reach what lies ahead, so I can lay a hold of that which he laid a hold of me for. It's very important for you and me to understand that Jesus obtained us with a purpose. He laid a hold of me for a reason. I don't just want to get more from him. I want to fulfill that reason. When you fulfill that reason, you're as free as you'll ever be. People that think life is a grind, life is tough, life's a bleep, a blip, a blank. They're living life outside of why they're here. Why would God empower you to be on a road you were never created to travel? I'm done. I'm, I'm a minute past. I'm so sorry. Watch this. For the edifying of our Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a complete man, to the measure of the stature, till we, how many of us? All of us come to the unity of the faith the knowledge of the Son of God, because that's who we're living through, to a complete man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of God, Whew. that we should no longer just be tossed to and fro, hearsay, feelings, emotions, other motives, just by what people are saying, the motives in other men's hearts. In other words, so we're no longer dictated by all this stuff going on around us, no longer tossed to and fro, children carried about by every doctrine, trickery of men, cunning craftiness, deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, watch this, may grow up in how many things? All things into him. You see the journey we're all on? Please be on that journey. Please don't come here because it's a cool church. This is a cool church. You've got cool leaders. You've got youth that are fired up. You've got an amazing choir. They just kept coming down the steps. I said, I didn't realize there was that many people up there. You have a fun and awesome church. I'm sure the teaching is awesome. When these leaders get up here and share, there's life in them. Don't just come here for that. Come here to become everything he paid for so that when you go out these doors, you're on that journey and that mission of why he came and why he's in you. And every day is life in the mission field. Every day you can sow a seed. Every day you can water a seed. Every day you can see God bring increase. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Put your hand to the plow and never look back. Endure hardship as a good soldier and never again get entangled in the affairs of this life. Why? We're in the world. We're not of the world. We're sanctified and set apart. Are you with me? Every one of us can live this way. Every one of us. Would you, would you be so kind to stand to your feet? I'd love to pray over you guys if I could. Is that okay? And then... Pastor, you can come up and close out in a sec. I just felt like I wanted to pray over us. Thanks for your patience with me. I know I'm just a hair over time. Had a little bit more of a liberty probably just because I knew it was the second service and not the first. Transition time. <laughs> Y'all okay? Can you imagine the love God has for us? Like To him, I'm just saying this. this is how, to him, we're the best. Like he made us with a reason and a purpose and he never lost sight of that purpose no matter where we've lived, how we've lived and how far we've lived from it. He says, I know who you are. I know what I've created you for and I know what you'll look like when I'm in you and you're surrendered. So because he so loved us, he sent his son to the cross. It would be different if it said God was so frustrated and at wit's end with humanity, he finally sent his son. That's not why he sent his son. He sent his son because of love. 
And what he's saying is, whether you know it or not, I know who you are. I know why you're here. And I know why I created you. And I'm telling you to him, we're the best he's got. We're the best he's got. So go ahead and just be the best. Amen? Walk in love. Show mercy. Make peace. Don't let your heart get offended. Guard it. Because out of it flows the issues of life. You say, but the whole room's against God. Make sure you're for God. Well, the whole room's against me. Make sure you're not against them. Learn how to turn the cheek and not think you're being passive. Learn how to endure hardship without believing you're a doormat. Jesus wasn't a doormat. He was the living epistle of God and love. He was the expression of him. So would you do this with me? Would you lift your hands with me? And just as a sign of yielding and surrender and trust that when we pray, that this grace to live everything we're hearing would rest on us. For some, you know what I'm hearing right now? Now I see why we're praying like this. It's cool. Most of the time, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. To you, I might look like I know, but I don't have a clue most of the time. But I get it right now. For some of you that don't even feel motivated by this message, that God would even grant a motivation and get your attention in these truths. For some of you that feel like, you know, that's just a little more than I'm looking for. Paul said that every one of us would have this mind. And even if you think otherwise, even God revealed this to you. So, Father, I just thank you that you're the one that stirs the pot of our desire. You're the one that gives us grace to pursue. God, without you, we wouldn't even pursue you. No one comes to the Father unless he's drawn by him. Would you do this incredible drawing to this truth? Would you bring this excitement to our hearts? For some that feel unmotivated or feel like this is too much, would you let them see that we're just scratching the surface of what we're created to be and that there's so much more? Would you do a work in our lives that only grace can accomplish? Would you do a work in our lives that only you could do? God, I'm asking that everyone would be found to run well, be encouraged, and be set upright today by the love and mercy of God through the blood of Jesus and the empowerment of Holy Spirit. Let this calling be a normal and natural thing to us and let us see every day why we're on this earth. In Jesus' name, I bless this house and pray that truth and understanding would rest here and that the manifestation of Christ would be evident in Jesus' holy name. Amen? Amen. Love you. Thank you. Stay amazing. Wow. Just wow. Amen? Come on. Can we give it up for Dan Mahler one more time? Man, what an amazing, amazing weekend that we had. Just the honor just to be with him. So good. So good. Um, at the end of every service, we have elders up front to pray anything you need whatsoever. Come, we're here to just uh, to pray over you, uh, pray the prayer of faith. If it's healing, whatever you need, just come. Uh, our elders will be up front. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, man, he's in this room. You've encountered him all service. Do not leave him here, okay? I'll come out, pray with our elders. We want to get you on a journey that will change your life forever. You heard it all morning. It will change your life forever. It's absolutely amazing. Well, we love you guys. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I know you are absolutely blessed. Come on, let me ask you one more time. Were you blessed this morning? Absolutely. And I'm so glad that these are recorded. There are uh, everything. I'm going to go back and just feed on this weekend over and over and over and over again. There's so much revelation and truth to be digging out of this. Well, we love to give a shout of victory on the count of three. We say hallelujah. Here we go. One, two, three. Hallelujah. We love you guys. We'll see you on Wednesday.